Um, for tonight's reading, if you can open your Bibles in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. So you can find that on page 1172 of your church Bibles. Okay. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Thank you, Amy, very much uh, for that. It'd be great if you can keep it up in front of you. We're going to think about it for a few minutes together now. Um, just before, thank you very much, Adrian. Brilliant. Just before we do, can I just say, you know, look around you and look at these tables and the chairs and the cake and the hot stuff and the fantastic band on the stage and the brilliant guys on the AV. Um, isn't it amazing? I think it's a lot better than that. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. yeah. I, I am so encouraged by uh, what's going on in evening church. And... Um, but it's not going to happen just because it happens automatically. It only happens because people get behind it and say, we want this to happen. We want this to get even better. And um, there's some people working really hard to make it happen. They're passionate about it. But it would be brilliant if a few more could get alongside them and say, we're on board with this as well. We want to make a difference. We'll help. We'll get here early to set up. We'll sort out some of the refreshments and that kind of thing. Uh, because we want to create this environment where people can meet Jesus in a, a comfortable way that works for them. And uh, we really want to strengthen the teams that are doing that. So if, you, if you're interested, if you think there's something I could, I could give here, can you just pop down the front and see Sophie at the end, uh, who's helped us with loads of this and would love to talk to you. Um, you don't have to be like a super saint in order to do this. You don't have to be a member of the church. Um, you just have to say, I want to be a part of making this happen, which hopefully lots of us do. So there's going to be a big queue by Sophie at the end. Now, over at the last uh, little while, um, we've been going through the book of Romans in uh, the New Testament. And this evening, we're kind of still in that series, but we're taking a, a bit of a detour uh, away from it. Because in the last section, we were looking at this whole issue of, of the work of the Holy Spirit and how he wants to change us deep inside. And this is a, an important enough topic that I thought, let's just pause here a little bit longer before we uh, go off into the rest of Romans 8 and think about this topic of change, how God changes us, how change is possible. So that's the, uh, that's the, the headline this evening. You can change if you really want to. Let me put it in context by telling you about one of my Christmas presents last year, okay? I got one of the Ladybird books called The Midlife Crisis. I don't know why, but um, somebody gave that to me. I'm far too young for it. Anyway, um, I'll just read you a couple of bits from it. Duncan brought a second-hand bike using money he got for his 38th birthday. Three years later, Duncan is competing in the Tour de France on a bike that costs more than the deposit for his first flats. 
Duncan has forgotten what he's trying to prove. Paul recently bought a shark, a shark tooth necklace. Ray spent the morning bidding on a leather bike jacket. Last night, Charlie Googled local triathlons. Why am I telling you this? Because, I mean, most of you here are at least two decades away from a midlife crisis, so why is it relevant? I'm saying it because, actually, this is my life right now, actually. I mean, I'm just wanting to be honest as we, as we kick off into this. This whole issue of personal change is day-to-day -day struggle for me. It's difficult. Okay, so I just want to be honest about that. And to be honest, there are days when the only sense in which I feel I'm winning in that struggle is that I'm still on the battlefield. But other than that, it can feel quite a mess. It's difficult. It's been a surprise for me. So as I talk about this this evening, I am not standing on any kind of moral high ground to give anybody a lecture, okay? And I'm not going to give you any easy answers or any quick fixes because that wouldn't have integrity. Change is a struggle. But Romans does tell us that change is possible. We can change. Not, not that we can change ourselves. This isn't about a little bit of self-help or moral trying harder. That doesn't work at all. It's not about box ticking or knuckling under, under the rules. No, but Romans is saying, if we're Christians... We can change because God's Spirit, His Holy Spirit, His personal transforming presence lives in us. And that's why change is possible. Last week from Romans 7, we saw it like this. Romans 7, this is from one of the other translations. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemns sin in the flesh. That's talking about the cross. But what's the purpose of the forgiveness that comes through the cross? It's in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's an incredible claim. The righteousness of the law fulfilled in us who walk according to the Holy Spirit. A stunning claim. But whatever it is saying... It isn't saying less than change is possible if you're a Christian. Actually, change should be normal if you're a Christian. Or as Chris summarized it last week, he's not really a reverend doctor or an MBE, but I just thought that was funny, but nobody else is laughing, that's okay. <laughs> as he put it, the Holy Spirit sets us free to obey Change is in our DNA. Thanks, Chris. Great line. So I want to start off being real. Change is hard, and it's a real battle, and we're going to see that in the passage here this evening. But at the same time, I'm not just going to preach to you my experience and the struggle. Because the Bible says, and if we're going to be biblical, change isn't just a battle. It is possible. God wants to help us change. And he wants to do it not by the rules, but by the spirits. Okay, but what does that mean? How, what's that in practice? How does that really work? Well, four things to draw out from Galatians 5 that uh, we just had read to us. Number one, we need to keep challenging our vision of what freedom is. Keep challenging your vision of freedom. Let me just try and uh, put this in context. Back in uh, the 90s, a few of you here will be able to remember, there was an Oasis song about freedom. I'm free to be whatever I choose, and I'll sing the blues if I want. I'm free to say whatever I like. If it's wrong or right, it's all right. A vision of freedom. Whatever I want. Wow. It is actually an incredibly attractive vision of freedom, isn't it? Whatever I want, amazing. Except that when you pursue that vision of freedom, what happens is that your world gets shrunk narrower and narrower. Your relationships get more and more messed up until you end up lonely and shriveled up, imprisoned by your own desires and wants 
because that's all there is in life. And the thing that's promising freedom ends up being your prison, isolating you, going nowhere. Because in the end, it isn't actually a vision of freedom at all. It's just destructive rebellion dressed up as freedom. And once that rebellion has got its grip on us, we won't be serious about change. And we'll end up anything but free. If we want to be truly free, if we want to change, we've got to keep challenging that rebellious vision of freedom and choosing a different one instead. Verse 13 of the passage, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, yippee, but what's it all about? Verse 13, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. That's the freedom that we were made for, serving one another humbly in love. That's actually what life is, because that's the life for which we were made. That's where freedom is. Why? Verse 14, because the whole law, that's like all the Old Testament law of Moses, is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Real freedom is freedom to love and to serve in humility. That's the life God made us for. Not riding roughshod over people, but serving them. Not asserting yourself, but serving humbly. Not loving yourself and prioritizing your needs, but loving one another before yourself. That's real life. And ultimately, that's actually where joy is to be found. So here's this different vision of freedom to pursue. And the problem is, if you pursue the other vision of freedom instead, it's going to end up messing you up big time. Verse 15, if you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. The stakes are really high with the vision of freedom that you embrace and are pursuing. And we've got to, again, if we want to be on a journey of change, by relentlessly, constantly challenging the vision of freedom that is setting the framework for our lives. Keep challenging that vision of freedom. Number two, keep choosing the desires of the Holy Spirit, verses 16 to 18. I used to, uh, on Friday mornings, play hockey with some friends, indoor hockey, and I absolutely loved it. I wasn't much good at it, but I was fairly quick around the court. And so I just threw myself in 100%, and I went for it, bombing from one end to the other the whole time, trying to convince myself and everybody else that I was being useful when really I was just wearing myself out. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. We played for an hour usually, and usually about 40 minutes in, I started to feel it, because I am old enough for a midlife crisis, honestly. My legs were aching, my hands were pulling, my feet were feeling a bit battered because I was running around in an old pair of squash shoes, and I was getting out of breath. I was tired. And in that moment, half of me was increasingly desperate just to stop this game and stop being a sensible 50-year-old instead of herring around up and down the court. But the other half of me was desperate to win and keep going. Two sets of desires, and I had to choose. One set of desires would lead to defeat if I gave up. The other, with a fair wind and a decent team, which, to be fair, couldn't always be guaranteed, The other would lead to victory, but I had to choose. And you know, being a Christian is a lot like that. Paul says in this passage, we have these two sets of desires within us. We have desires that arise from the work of the Holy Spirit in us, the desires that he is birthing in us as he works in our lives all the time. But then alongside that, we've got the old desires of what he calls the flesh, That's not our body. The flesh here is our deep inside messed upness, if you know what I mean. The fact that deep down we're broken and want bad stuff too. And so we've got these two sets of desires. One that the Holy Spirit is is birthing in us. The other that our flesh 
is developing in us. And those two desires face each other in our hearts in open warfare. Have a look at verses 16 and 17. He says, I say, live by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. They are in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want to do. Conflict, open warfare in your hearts. The work of the Spirit, giving you good desires for love and kindness and peace and gentleness and self-control. And then the desires of the flesh, our messed upness, pulling at us all the time, feeding destructive desires for selfishness, lust, greed, and power. The two sets of desires are there. They're warring in our hearts. And we've got to keep choosing which desires we're going to follow, which desires we're going to act on, which desires we're going to nurture and give space to and listen to. Now, this isn't meant to be just a kind of level playing field between two equal and opposite powers, the flesh and the spirit. It's not quite like that. Verse 16 says, live by the spirit, literally walk by the Spirit. In other words, there's a relationship with the Holy Spirit, who's not a thing but a person, a relationship with the Holy Spirit to cultivate, live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, develop day by day your relationship with the Spirit, become sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and be be submissive to the Holy Spirit, almost as like a kind of habit in your life. Develop that relationship with the Holy Spirit, walk in the Spirit. When we do that, when we learn to walk in the Spirit, end of verse 16, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So it's not just two equal and opposite things on a flat battlefield. No, this is about a relationship with the Spirit. And also, this isn't just two rival sets of boxes to tick. Good desires, bad desires, tick, 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 cross, cross, cross. It's not that. It's deeper, it's about our hearts. It's choosing to follow the desires that come from the work of the Spirit in you. And doing that is not choosing in spite of yourself, but choosing in line with your true self as a child of God. Verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. In other words, it's not just there's a law here, And that's bad, and that's good, so you must choose the good ones and forget the bad ones. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, no, you have this relationship with God. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. He's developing these desires in your very nature. This is your true new self in Jesus, desiring good stuff. So make it your habit in life to submit to the good stuff, to keep in step with the Spirit, to nurture that relationship with the Holy Spirit who lives in you. And if you do, gradually, the loud voice of the flesh is gonna become a little bit easier to push down and to reject. Now look, I'm no different to anyone else. My deep inside messed upness, my flesh, wants power wants to win whatever the cost to anybody else, sometimes wants to mess around sexually, wants to do whatever I want to do without consequence, just like yours does. We're the same. But these are not my only desires, because the Holy Spirit lives in me and is growing desires within me to be gentle, to love people well, to be pure, to be faithful, to be kind. There's a real sense in which I want both of those. I experience both sets of desires. But those better desires become stronger the more tuned in I am to the work of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the more I'm worshiping what is good and beautiful and pure, the more I'm making space for silence in my life to reflect on what God's saying. The more I'm reading my Bible with a teaching, teachable, open heart, the more I'm bringing my confusion to God, asking him to change me 
and make me like Jesus. The more I'm in tune with the work of the Spirit, the greater strength I have to resist the downward pull of the flesh, which is still there. Keep choosing the Spirit's desires. And then thirdly, keep your vision sharp, verses 19 to 23. Uh, the other day, somebody gave me a book on leadership. I think they thought I needed to get a whole lot better, which I do. And so, very helpfully, they gave me a book to read. And um, in it, there was a quote from the CEO of a massively successful high-tech startup that's now kind of multiple billion pound turnover already. And it says this, if you could get all the people, do you like the picture of the dog with glasses on? Sharp vision, that's the idea. If you could get all the people in an organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. Clear vision, he says. With clear vision, you can change the world. That's basically the point. It's a huge challenge uh, to me in my work here in the church. But whether it's in business or in church or in sport, in so many spheres of life, having clear vision is key if you want to accomplish change. But that's true for changing yourself as well. And I don't know if you're like this, but one of the things that my deep inside messed upness most wants to do is to bring blurring to my moral vision instead of clarity. To make me think, yeah, well, that's not really wrong, is it? Or it's just it's a bit near the boundary, but, but blur the vision. That's what my flesh wants to do. So that actually I start justifying loads of stuff that isn't good. We're brilliant at that as human beings, aren't we? We can justify anything if we try hard enough. And so I really love the outrageous kind of cut-through-the-nonsense clarity of verse 19, where he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Do you get that? Obvious. You know it really. It's just that we don't want to face it, do we? We know in many ways what's right and wrong, but we don't want to face it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And I think we can think of those acts of the flesh as being the enemies of real freedom. Verse 19, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. My problem when I read a list like that is I see the two or three things that I never do, and I think, oh yeah, that's not me. But look a little bit harder. And actually, most of us, I think, will have to admit the acts of the flesh are active in us. But, but my flesh wants to blur the boundaries. Sexual immorality, oh, come on, I'm no worse than most people. Give me a break. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, factions. But hang on, I'm in the right anyway. And I've just got a bad temper. I'm wired up that way. Give me a break. And Paul cuts through it all. No, he says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Face it. You know it. Don't muddy the moral waters, but keep your moral vision clear if you want to change. But then this contrast, the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And fruit is for tasting, isn't it? Here's the taste of real freedom. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. What a fantastic vision of how life could be. It's not complicated. You don't really need me to give you a whole lecture on each of those things. They're kind of straightforward. And notice they're not just a list of good behaviors to tick. So many of them are about things that grow in our hearts, which are beautiful and life-affirming, love, joy, and patience, and peace. And they don't just grow through self-help, through trying harder, through just saying no. No, they grow by going deeper with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You see what he's saying? If you want to change, 
nurture your relationship with the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of that relationship in your life will be love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. The fruits of the Spirit. Notice how relational they are as well. Even peace in Paul is usually to do with resolution and healing in relationships, not just deep inner tranquility, but peace with my brothers and sisters. Peace. In one sense, all of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are summed up and held together by the first. The fruit of the Spirit is love, healthy relationships, the fruit of the Spirit. And notice that though they are produced by the Holy Spirit, it doesn't turn us into robots, that it works that way. End of verse 23, gentleness and self-control. Isn't that interesting? Self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. You'd think it would be God-control, not self-control. But no, God comes to restore our humanity, to make us self-controlled, because that's what he made us to be, not just robots. And if you want to see what this real, beautiful humanity looks like in reality, then look no further than Jesus Christ. Read the Gospels. See how he lived, because he was full of this fruit in the way that he lived. And the more you worship and love him for who he is, the more the Holy Spirit will use that love to change your heart so that you long to be like him. Keep your vision clear and sharp. And finally, keep living out who you really are, verses 24 to six. Um, in the Rizbridge household, around this time of year, um, we have our annual row, okay? It's fairly good-natured, really. But it's always to do with the Christmas tree, okay? Um, in my opinion, we have a perfectly good one in the loft, which I can get out of the box and put up, and it will be fine. But everyone else wants to go to Ikea to buy one that the planet badly needs in order to breathe, not that I'm raising the stakes or anything, but that some bright lumberjack has fell down to get into my lounge. Why, I want to know. So the other day I began the debate on WhatsApp, hoping for some support from my new son-in-law, Ewan, because I'm usually in a minority of one on this. And Ewan's initial reply was very helpful. He said, I had the same Christmas tree for 16 years growing up, and I, it never did me any harm. Yes, boy, I thought. Very good. But unfortunately, he then ruined everything by adding, although I grew taller than it was, and that was sad. <laughs> My daughter quickly responded, rather more helpfully than I expected, by saying, that is not a Risbridger problem. <laughs> You see, Ewan is one of us now, and so he's going to have to, to learn to stop seeing the world from the perspective of a normal-sized human being and see it from a hobbit's perspective. <laughs> the possibility of change in the end boils down to a question of identity, who you really are. That's the issue. Verse 24 those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, if you're a Christian, Jesus says, hey, you are not the neutral player in this battle between the flesh and the spirit. No, you're one of us now. You made that key decision not to let your deep inside messed upness be in charge anymore. You crucified the flesh. That's what it meant to become a Christian. You ended that whole way of living in which your messed up desires took charge in your life. It was finished. And you began a new way of life by the Holy Spirit. Verse 25, since we live now by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. In other words, remember who you are as a Christian and be who you are. Live out your new identity in Jesus. Embrace your freedom and live it well by dancing to the rhythm of the Holy Spirit, 
whose beating heart pulsates inside of you. I wonder, are you not yet a Christian? And to be honest, you know that you want to change, but you find change really hard. Look, here's the good news, the great news, the great news. God God wants to get involved in your life. He wants to help you go on a journey of change, but he isn't going to do it by just shouting a load of instructions at you and then tell you to go and get on with it. No, he wants to come into an intimate relationship with you through what Jesus did on the cross and then take you on a journey of change in partnership with his Holy Spirit who he will send to live in you. You won't be alone on the journey of change. God can change you, and he's ready to do that. Or maybe you're a Christian who's got stuck and you've stopped changing. You're really no more like Jesus now than you were a year ago, perhaps even less in some ways. Then take it to your heart. You can change if you learn to sing in tune with the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can change. It means keeping on challenging your vision of freedom. It means keeping on choosing the desires of the Spirit over the desires of your messed upness. It means keeping your vision clear and sharp. It means living out every day who you really are in Jesus, by the help of his spirit? Is there a pattern of relationships that's destructive and it needs changing? Is there an addictive pattern of behavior that needs breaking? Are there values which are driving your decisions which you know are not in tune with God's heart and they need to shift? Is there a big mistake you've made that you've yet to face up to and put right, and you're still feeling the implications. You can change, not by yourself, but by the Holy Spirit who Jesus has given you. So don't give up, and don't stand just alone. Get help from your brothers and sisters, and let's move forward together on this journey of change. I'm sure folk on our prayer ministry team would love to talk with you and pray with you if you want to take some steps on that journey this evening. Tom, over to you. Thank you.